you the assignment sheet here for the group presentations, and we're going to talk a little bit about these. I tried to accommodate everybody's first choices as best I could, but uh, there were a couple of things that were sort of necessary for me to do that meant I couldn't give everybody their first choice topic. Um, also, the fact that some topics were overwhelmingly more pop popular uh, than others. Such uh, as? I'm not going to say. But one thing that I had to do was sort of balance how much time you have to do the assignments alongside how many people would be in your group, right? Because we don't have a, to we don't have a, a total of 30 in the group. So the earlier groups have slightly more people in them, right? Because the later groups have more time to do the projects. Four, five, six. But yeah, like Leah, rest assured, I mean, this was done totally 100% blind, right? Because all you gave me were your student ID numbers, right? I tossed everything up into the air, kind of mix it around, and then just pull things out and try to give people their first or second choices when possible. Okay, so your presentation is going to have to be 25 minutes long, right? It's okay if it's a little over, not okay if it's under. Right? It needs to be at least 25 minutes. So what this means is that when you're practicing, you should probably make sure that you've got more like 28, 29 minutes because you're going to talk faster when you're up in front of people, right? So make sure you have more material than you actually need. I am also going to want to meet with each group about a week before you do the presentation just to see where you're at, to see what you've got, and to go over the materials with you. Right? Everybody's going to have to, each group is going to have to use at least five secondary sources. I've recommended three for each of you. You don't have to use all of my recommended sources. You can branch out, but you know, this is just something to get you started. You can branch out from there, right? I've also been giving you bibliographies. Um, you can use these to find resources if you need to as well. Um, okay, so group one is going to be working on the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So uh, it would be a good idea for you to take note of who is in your group and to probably get together after class and exchange information so you can get started on this as early as possible. So group one is going to be uh, Kishandra Ship, Ramona Thielen, Drew Burrell, Linda Kent, and Haley Richardson. Right, you guys will be working on the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So working on Industrial Revolution literature. It's going to be Rachel Grimes, Lawrence Sawyer, Alan Bataglia, and Kanaya Little and Alicia Myers who weren't here. Um, working on Tennyson's Idols of the King, right? Barry Kinservic, Dejan McLean, Noah Cunard. Please indicate understanding when I so when I call your name so that other people can recognize you. Thank you. Um, Quentin Sanders and Michael Poupard. All right, uh, working on Shaw, uh, Mrs. Warren's Profession. Uh, Kendra Anderson, Savannah Marchbanks, who does not appear to be here, um, Elizabeth Wills, and Ashton Satterfield. Working on First World War Poetry, Jeremy Copeland, back there in the corner. Brianna Wilson. Uh, Brian Mondonga, who has dropped the class, so we'll have to work something out there. Uh, Madison McElroy. And working on British Literature and Immigration, Victory Walker, Ashley Campbell, Haley Hammett, and Sarah Holmes. Okay, so everybody took note of who's in your group, right? Everybody at least knows which group they're supposed to be in. Right, it's right here on the sheet. So try to get together at the end of class and exchange information. Um, okay, so as far as what I actually want you doing here, 
right? One thing that you're going like, I'm going to need a group of bibliography from each of you, right? So each group is going to have to give me a list of the sources they consulted. I only need one for each group. However, each individual in the group is going to have to give me a short write-up telling me who did what, right, and how much people contributed. This is basically to keep people honest, right? I remember uh, being assigned to groups when I was a student um, where one poor motivated sap um, just ended up having to do all the work for everybody else, and I don't want that to happen to any of you, right? So this is to make sure everyone is pulling his or her weight. So you're going to write a short paragraph describing what he, for each member of the group describing what they did, including yourself, right? Because I want to see how your self-assessment matches what your group members say about you. And you're going to rate each member of your group from one to five, one being low, five being high, on the following three dimensions, right? First, responsiveness. Did this individual actually respond to emails, phone calls, and text messages when you tried to get a hold of them? And did he or she show up for meetings on time and ready to work? I also want you to rate your group members' collegiality, right? Were they pleasant to work with? Did they resolve conflicts with other group members in a mature fashion? Or did they yell and scream and stamp their feet until they got their own way? And finally, I want to know something about each member's intellectual contribution to the project, right? You know, it's one thing to be responsive, it's one thing to be nice, right? Those are all good things. But I want to know who contributed what ideas as well, right? I want to know who was actually doing the intellectual heavy lifting here. Because, um, you know, somebody could be perfectly nice and agreeable, but could still be just doing what other people in the group are telling them to do, right? Instead of actually doing the, uh, much of the work themselves. So I want to try to make sure that you guys are splitting workloads relatively evenly. Now, that said, like, as far as making the presentation good, right, rather than just getting it done, right, <clears throat> how many of you enjoy sitting in a dark room with a PowerPoint slide up? while somebody drones on and on about the text that's on the PowerPoint slide. Yeah, I don't see a lot of hands up, right? It's boring as shit, right? It puts people to sleep. So try not to do that. You can use PowerPoint or Prezi or some kind of other you know, slide program if you need to, but generally what that stuff is best for is like if you need to show a lot of pictures, right? Try not to put a lot of text on the slides and try not to rely heavily on it. <clears throat> what you should be trying to do as best you can is engage with the class, right? Whether that's through sort of like some activity that you've planned to help reinforce um, the material, even if you're just making eye contact with people asking the class questions, right? Do something to try to keep your class engaged. And think about the classes that you actually like going to and what those instructors do, bless you. And try to imitate those methods, right? Think of it as that, again, you are, te you are teaching the class, but you're teaching with a group rather than by yourself. Um, a good presentation is also going to be well integrated, right? I can tell when people just get together and they say, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and everybody just kind of goes off in their separate corners and you don't really work together on it, right? I want you guys to be rehearsing these presentations before you give them, right? The more you rehearse, the more you'll be able to eliminate redundant information so that you're not all saying the same three or four things, right? And it's good if you're able to bounce off of each other and respond to each other, rather than simply read a, read, read a pre-written part off of a card, right? It's going to be more interesting for the class to watch as well. Um, okay. Finally, I do want you to take the research portion of this very, very seriously, right? No internet sources. No online summaries, right? No schmoop.com, no spark notes, none of that shit, right? Books and journal articles that you get from the library. That's what your sources have to be. 
So this is another reason to start early, yes, because our library does not move quickly. If you need help with the research portion of this, you can come to me. You can also contact our reference librarian. Some of you, I think, have probably worked with him before. His name is John Wilson, and you can reach him at john.wilson at gsw.edu and set up an appointment to meet with him. And he'll help you find the things you need. Right? I've also given you some places to start, as we said. Um, OK, so does anybody have any questions about this? No, yeah, Drew. So where do we get the actual um, papers? Is it in our actual books that we got from the syllabus, or do we have to go to a different? Oh, yeah, oh you mean the, your actual presentation topic? Yeah. They're all in the anthology. Yeah, they're all in the textbook you buy for the class. I'm sorry, what were you uh, going to ask, Nellie? When you said library for research, does that include Galileo? That includes Galileo. Oh, yeah, that's a library resource. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can absolutely use Galileo. What, the thing I don't want you doing is just Googling a bunch of shit and using whatever comes up first, right? That's not research, that's lazy. So don't do that. But like I said, yeah, if you need or want help, you can come talk to me, you can talk to John Wilson. John actually probably knows really better than I do how to use all our library resources because that's his job. Um, so uh, any other questions? Everything clear, everything good? Okay, great, then before we get back into the French Revolution, I do just have one more thing I want to bring out to you. So I'm going to pass around here a photocopy of the reading for next time with all of my little annotations in the margins whited out. It's cheating. <laughs> well, this is because what I want you to do is practice annotating something that you're reading, right? I want you to make notes in the margins while you read, right? So whenever you see something that looks like an important recurring image or idea, whenever you see something that you have a question about, right? Why is this here? What's this, you know, what's this all about? What's this doing here? When you feel like you want to summarize or paraphrase something for yourself, right, try to put it into plainer language, and really just anything that looks potentially meaningful to you, right? Make a little note of it in the margins. I think we may have talked a little bit about this last time, but. Um, Remember, if you're highlighting passages of the text, all you're indicating is that you wanted to remember something about this. You're not indicating what you wanted to remember about it or why you wanted to go back to it. If you are doing this kind of annotation directly in your books, you will have a better shot at remembering things that you read. So I'm just sort of trying to help you develop good habits from the beginning of the semester here. Now, if you rented your textbook, that is, you don't own it, then you can use sticky notes or you can you know, write your comments in pencil. So when you have to give it back, you can erase them, right? So you're going to do this annotation, right? You're going to bring it back on Monday. You're going to turn those into me. I will look over your annotations. And we're going to then have our first quiz on Monday, right? On a lot of Equiano. Normally I won't announce these quizzes. I'm giving you a shot, I'm, I'm warning you in advance this time to try to demonstrate how doing this kind of annotating can better prepare you for the quiz. So to that end, I'm also gonna give you um, the guide questions now instead of at the end of class. So you can think about these as you're reading, right? These are the kinds of patterns, these are the kinds of ideas you're going to want to look out for while you're reading at Rihanna. And is this coming to life or not? 
Come on. Wake up. All right, there we go. Stupid tech. All right. Can everybody read this or do I need to hit a light? I'll hit, I'll hit, the, I'll hit the, the front light. Better? Okay. Just take a couple minutes, copy this down. Is taking a picture of it still okay? Taking a picture of it in this, in, yeah, okay, that would be acceptable. I generally prefer that you write things down because, as we've said, like you'll remember it better if you write it down. My handwriting is terrible, and I sometimes can't read it <laughs> after it's so. Who's still, uh, who's still taking this down? Okay, that's all right, most of you. All right, just keep at it. Is everybody just about finished? Okay. Great. So let's put this back up and write. All right. So let's try to pick up from where we left off um, last time. 
Right, so I ask you to look at that passage in which Edmund Burke describes the queen of France, Marie Antoinette, a little bit more closely. And to try to consider it in terms of that doctrine of the sublime and the beautiful that we talked about. Now, can somebody remind me of what Burke means when he talks about the sublime and the beautiful. What's beautiful and what is sublime? Um, beautiful is like an object of desire, like the, um, statues or jewelry or something like that, the visible pleasures. Right, like a small statue or like a, you know, something you could actually put up on your mantle, right? And the sublime is like big, huge, awe-inspiring, mm -hmm. terrible things like the pyramids or the massive statues in Greece. Right, so the beautiful is an object of desire, something that can be possessed, right? The sublime is an object of awe, right? Fascination, terror, potentially, right? The sublime isn't necessarily scary, but it is something that makes you feel tiny. It is something that makes you feel less significant. Right, okay, so beautiful is an object of desire. The sublime is an object of awe. Now, in his description of the queen on page 191 here, is he describing her in terms of the beautiful, in terms of the sublime, why? I kind of feel like in terms of her as a person, he describes her as an object that's beautiful, uh -huh. but what she represents as a person of the nobility, what she is is sublime. Okay. If that makes sense. So a beautiful person slash object representing some sort of larger idea, right? Yeah, like a really beautiful statue of Christ. And but not the Okay, I'd like to draw your attention briefly to the sort of this part in the middle of uh, the big paragraph in the middle of page 191, right? Uh, little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fallen upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and of cavaliers. I thought 10,000 swords must have leaped from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult but the age of chivalry is gone. What does this suggest about the way he regards the queen or the ideas that she represents? That it was a sublime um, standing, that her position or the position that she was trying to fill with the nobility was something to be defended, but. Well, look, let me ask you this. Does the sublime, that thing that makes you feel tiny and shit your pants in fear, right? Mm -hmm. Does that need defending from anyone or anything? No. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, no, I, I think that to a certain extent she represents the type of purity. Uh huh. And uh, and I'm assuming back then was in the night days weren't knights uh, when they fought in honor of somebody correct? And that honor was no longer, especially when it comes to females. Yeah. That honor is no longer. There. He's referring to those kind of like imagined medieval courtly love literary traditions, right? Where a knight fights for the honor of a lady. A lady gives the knight, you know, her scarf or some token of her favor that he's supposed to carry into battle, right? And he is supposed to pledge himself to defend her from harm. So while the queen is, you know, the most beautiful vision that has ever lighted upon this orb, right? You know, as he says, right? She is also something that is weak and in need of defense. And the fact that she has to defend herself now, right, that she has to carry concealed in her bosom the little vial of poison or the dagger that would end her life should she be dishonored, right? He regards this as a falling off in civilization or as a falling off in culture, right? So the queen, as a woman, belongs for Burke to the realm of the beautiful even if he does sort of venerate the royal ideal, right? So let's compare this with Mary Wollstonecraft on page 194. 
And I probably this will all provide sort of background for what's going on in the two poems I asked you to read for today. So if you look on page 194, a vindication of the rights of men. Uh, can we can I get somebody to read from the bottom of the page here, starting with a letter to the right honorable Edmund Burke? I can do it. Yeah, go for it. Um, sir. It is not necessary, with courtly insincerity, to apologize to you for thus intruding on your presence, nor to profess that I think it an honor to discuss an important subject with a man whose, liter whose literary abilities have raised him to notice in the state. I have not yet learned to twist my periods, nor in the equivocable idiom of politeness to, dis to, di to disguise my sentiments and imply what I should be afraid to utter. If, therefore, in the course of this epistle, I chance to express contempt and, either in, and even indignation, with some emphasis, I beseech you to believe that it is not a flight of fancy, for truth and morals has ever appeared to me the essence of the sublime, and in taste, <coughs> simplicity, the only criteria, the criterion of the beautiful. But I war not with an individual when I contend for the rights of men and the liberty of reason. You see, I do not consent to call my words to avoid the invidious phrase, yeah, invidious, invidious phrase, mm -hmm. nor shall I which a lively fancy has intervo interwoven with the present exception of the, of the term. Reverencing the rights of humanity, I shall dare to assert them, not intimidated by the hoarse laugh that you have raised, or waiting till time has wiped away the compassionate tears which you have elabor elaborately labored to excite. Okay, so thank you. All right, so if we look at this, um, this paragraph in which she introduces her arguments counter to Burke, right? What is she saying about Burke and about the way Burke writes and about the way Burke thinks? Is this complimentary in any way? No. It's mocking him. It is mocking, yeah. And in what ways is she most directly mocking him? Using big words. Okay. Oh, he uses big oh, words oh, to hide what Yeah, she makes direct reference to the sublime and the beautiful, right? So she says, I'm familiar with your aesthetic writings, right, and your literary reputation. And yeah, and as, as, uh, as she's like, she talks about twisting your periods and having literary ability, right, you know, using all of these fancy verbal tricks to conceal what it is you really mean. So, in the style that Burke himself prefers, right, this fancy florid style full of great big Latin derived words, she's basically telling him that she thinks he's full of shit, right? right. And we move from all of this flowery aesthetic language in that paragraph, right, lower down on page 195 to quitting now the flowers of rhetoric. Let us, sir, reason together. And believe me, I should not have meddled with these troubled waters in order to point out your inconsistencies if your wit had not burnished up some rusty, baneful opinions and swelled the shallow current of ridicule till it resembled the flow of reason and presumed to be the test of truth. So, look, I mean, to us, most 18th century writing looks a little bit florid, right? But compared to Burke, if you read through most of Wollstonecraft's essay, right, her language is much more direct and simple. And she is directly addressing ideas and arguments and not dressing them up in rhetorical figures or in um, sensational imagery, right? Um, you know, like, what was the particular terrifying image that Burke settled on in the portion of the reflections that you read? Um, um, the king being, uh, wait, what, what, beheading the, what, who, who was beheaded? The, well, nobody had been beheaded yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at the time. Queen almost yeah. being raped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 her bed right, and the bodyguards being dismembered, right, and right in front of her, and the, all the bloody limbs strewn across the palace at Versailles. That never and happened. Never happened, yeah. <laughs> Product of Burke's imagination. Well, yeah. Yeah, there, it, well, <laughs> well, I mean, that specific thing never did happen. But, yet yeah, people did, would a few years later, 
start getting their heads chopped off, right? right? And Wordsworth, in his poem, references some of that, right? So being in France at the time of what came to be called the Terror, when aristocrats started getting, uh, let's like being made about a foot shorter, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm being interrupted. No, go ahead. Those videos you put uh, for what? What is it in that folder? What is it? Um, unit one. It says it was something. I got some uh -huh. folders I'm looking at, but I watched those videos. Okay. That would just really just throw me off. But did you? I mean, reference that video to what we were doing, like, that first one, um, was that Oh, oh yeah, I, I completely forgot to mention that I do put things up on Georgia View um, in folders that reference okay. what we're doing on that particular day. Most of the, like, some of them are, are, BB, are podcasts of a uh, BBC literature and culture radio show called, they're, they're about 45 minutes long, um, and they're really informative. It's um, a well-informed host, uh, mostly interviewing academic experts. Um, and I also do post uh, videos, again, mostly stuff done by the BBC, because we just don't do that kind of shit in this country, um, that um, refer to the topics we're talking about in class. So yeah, so those are there for extra background material. But this is what he's touring, right? Versailles in um, Paris when all that was, when the, the net was going on. That's where he was in the video. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the guy hosting the video, the video is, the presenter, yeah, is going around for side in Paris. Can I ask yeah. like, what Burke's reaction was when the actual French Revolution happened? Because Well, th this was it. Was he, he, wrote, he wrote this days after the event occurred. Oh, okay. So th th this is why I'm so like, so he's, he was writing this before there was any real, any real violence or any sense that this was going to descend into serious bloodshed, right? Like, I just was curious, like, how do you feel, like, when after the king and queen were actually killed and they started, like, digging up dead, like, royalty and cutting their heads off? Uh-huh. Well, I mean, you know, obviously, probably, oh, yeah, probably vindicated, but <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, too, though, like, at the time that he writes this, right, no one knows for sure that that's what's going to happen, right? No one knows for sure that the Fran that you know the common people, the France, the Third Estate in France, are going to just start killing people, right? There's no indication yet that that's the direction this is going to take. Essentially, what happens is. Over the course of a few years, the most extreme voices take charge, and they start eliminating their more moderate enemies, as well as the conservatives whom they were fighting against in the first place. Right. So, it, um, just interesting side note regarding uh, the French Revolution. Does anybody know why we refer to uh, sort of the poles in our politics as right and left? right and left. It's the politician compass, isn't it? Well, yeah, but where does it come from, is what I'm asking. Does anybody know? So in the French uh, Estat National, right, so that National Assembly that was formed in the year of the Revolution, the conservative monarchist parties all sat on the right. And the rad parties of radical reform sat on the left in the chamber. So we still use that terminology to discuss our own politics. Isn't that a little bit ironic, though? Yeah. Well, in, in what way? I mean, like, well, you describe it as like, in, like imperialist and like stuff like that. And mm -hmm. a lot of, I'm, you know, I'm not going into that because <laughs> I don't feel like. I want a different yeah, I mean, we're, 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 right, we're talking about a different time and a different form of government, right? So, in, yeah, exactly. Like, in the era of the revolution, conservatism meant support for the monarchy, right? Whatever else that entailed. Um, so, it's also very important that once Wollstonecraft leaves behind all this stuff, talk about courtly insincerity, and all this flowery rhetoric, right? The first sentence, right, she is right, putting now, putting now the flowers of rhetoric, sir, let us 
reason together. So this idea of reason is really, really important in late 18th century, early 19th century thinking. Right. How many of you are familiar at all with Sir Isaac Newton? Anybody who know who Newton was? Okay, most of you know who Newton was. Right? What is Newton famous for? Yeah, for discovering mathematically the workings of gravity. Right? The story is he's sitting under an apple tree and the apple falls and conks him on the head. Well, alchemy too. And, well, alchemy, yeah. He was, yeah. He actually did more like, to research alchemy than he did with gravity, which is yeah. funny. Well, but the thing with gravity actually works. <laughs> That's, a, that's the difference, right? Um, but yeah, the, the, right, so Newton is one of the most influential thinkers of this age. He's, he's a mathematician primarily. And there's a group of philosopher mathematicians, people like Newton, like Rene Descartes, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, have you ever looked this guy up, has the most fabulous wig you've ever seen. Um, and what these guys argued for was a universe that was rationally ordered according to predictable principles, right? That the planets orbited the sun the same way every time. Natural processes always worked the same way. And if you just watched and observed, you could figure out what those processes were, right? That essentially the whole universe was a kind of giant equation or algorithm just waiting to be solved. Right? And it's reason, this idea of reason, that animates much of left wing opinion during the French Revolution. The leaders of the leftist parties were influenced by these philosophers, among others. And what they were trying to do was impose a kind of rational order, a kind of plan on French society that had nothing to do with tradition or hierarchy or heredity or superstition, right? This was, you know, a big part, well, the major part of their objection to the Catholic Church was the church was incredibly rich, right? That they had lots of money and owned lots of land and they weren't sharing any of that. But their philosophical objection to the church was um, an attitude towards superstition, right? They believed that the church was propagating superstitious beliefs with no basis in science. And so they replaced, eventually, like around the 1790s, uh, early 1790s, they started replacing Catholic churches with temples of reason. So. The use of the word reason in Wollstonecraft's argument indicates to us right away her alignment on this issue, right? That she's siding with the revolutionaries against Burke's, uh, what would be called an organicist view of society, right? So Wollstonecraft is a rationalist. <laughs> And I'm really, really sorry that this marker is so lousy. They're all lousy. And Burke is an organicist, right? Burke believes that societies evolve along natural lines, right? If you just leave society alone and don't tinker with it or try to impose any plans on it, right? <clears throat> Don't mess with tradition, and it will produce better results, right? Society is a natural growth that you have to allow to grow, rather than, say, like, you know, a bonsai tree that you have to sort of clip and prune, right? Whereas a rationalist would be interested in clipping and pruning that tree to get it into the desired shape, right? So everybody sees the basic philosophical distinction that we're making here. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Anything unclear at all? Can you say that last example you just said about the tree and something that you just said? 
Okay, um, so does, does everybody know what a bonsai tree is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's these things, like, they're popular in Japan. And it's a sort of meditation exercise, right? You take the tree and you clip little bits off of it to try to get it into a desi the desired shape, right? <coughs> so a rational, like, so if we think of that as a metaphor for society, the tree as a metaphor for society, a rationalist is all for clipping that tree to get it into the shape you want, right? We have this idea for society that we want this to fit. An organicist like Burke would argue against clipping the tree and just would say, just let it grow on its own. But see, that's where, what his problem was with a lot of people mocking him and stuff. Mm -hmm. Because he had that organic mindset mm -hmm. that it was like, okay. You don't realize that we're not going to be able to grow if nobody's happy. If everybody isn't, you know, mm -hmm. on the same page, you can't grow. So you got there uh -huh. on the other side. A lot of people mocking the fact that he was so flower with trying to get people to be convinced with mm -hmm. what he was saying. Because I noticed in one of his paragraphs, he said, um, he uh, and the English people know that what I'm saying is true, but he didn't say that. But uh -huh. you know, like, sure, he sure. said that. So you were first of all, he was throwing his ideas out there. Yeah. And I mocked about it. Then he uh -huh. tried to. Turn it around, and English people like y'all know what I'm saying is true, so you might as well accept, accept what I'm saying. He said it like, and I was mm -hmm. like, when I read it, I was like, oh, like, he just called yeah. in my face. Sure. Really so, yeah. go ahead. It's really funny that you say that because when he says like the English people know that it's true, he's not referencing like you know us common people. He's talking mm -hmm. to other learned noble people. So he's essentially. Yeah. Trashing yeah, yeah, other else. people who can read, yeah. yeah, and other people who are willing to sit and read long, convoluted sentences. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there there is yeah that class-based element to Burke's argument, right? He's not he's not pitching his argument to everybody. Wollstonecraft is actually trying to pitch her argument a little lower, right? Or more maybe maybe lower is the right, more broadly. But what I really want to get into here, and this is sort of what. I've got this um, up on the screen for is how this then influences the birth of the Romantic movements in England, right? The birth specifically of Romantic poetry. So probably about the earliest English poet to be directly associated with Romanticism is William Blake. Um, how many of you know anything, like, when I use this word romanticism, what does this mean to you? Like, what do you think of, if anything, when I say romanticism? Yeah, Jeremy. Well, I know it's, it's, I, it's kind of exaggerated, like fluffed up ideas. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, we, we, um, I'm trying to think of the word, we, it's not just an exaggeration, but you, uh -huh. you, know, you kind of hype it up. If it's something beautiful, you make it overly beautiful. Okay, so it, so you associate like with a kind of idealism. Yes. Right? Okay, so so you okay so when you romanticize something, you're constructing an ideal that the reality can't meet, right? So that's one of the negative connotations of the way we tend to use the word in popular discourse, right? Okay, good. Yeah. What else? What else do you think of when you hear the word romanticism? Like, if I was to, to tell you that we were going to study romantic poetry. What would you expect that to look like? I think it would be like. What would... Okay. Sure. Not, I mean, like it, I feel like it would be very like sort of like what Burke is into, like very traditionalist, mm -hmm. very um, like chivalry, like knights protecting ladies, but also following the flow of society. Okay, so you're thinking of this in terms of say like medieval romance, yeah. right? So yeah. taking this back, and that is actually where the term comes from, right? Mm -hmm. Um, as the rationalists in the late 18th century tried to banish superstition, one of the things that many, but not all, romantic poets, romantic artists try to bring back is the idea of the supernatural, right? So many of them write poems that feature ghosts or monsters or questing knights, vampires, things like that. Pardon? Yeah. What else? Anything else that you associate with the, the word romanticism or with romantic poetry or romantic art? They have ideals, like you said earlier, that 
I think they're trying to reach, but can only get it through their poetry. They feel like this mm -hmm. is something they don't have, so they got to write about it. Uh huh. They want to reach that lofty thing. They're more concerned with um, this grand idea that they're trying to reach for mm -hmm. that we don't have yet. Okay. So they're trying their best to mm -hmm. kind of make it a more tangible thing with their writings. And and the I think the the best I can say the best answer I can give to that is that some are and some aren't. Right. There are some romantic poets who are definitely idealists in the way you're suggesting. Um, there are others who are idealists in other kinds of ways, but we'll sort of we'll get to that over the next couple of sessions. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, and it's overly emotional. Okay, so you're overly so you can be so you full of emotion. Okay, okay, okay. So so so. so, 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 so it's just that like the romance, mm -hmm. in the romanticism type thing. It was in the time of war, so a lot of them, a lot of the poets and mm -hmm. stuff was writing this stuff when all, you know, all the terror was going on. Yeah. So I, when I when I hear mm -hmm. about the Mexican, I just automatically start thinking about the bad. So. Well, but you know, if we think about human history, yeah. from you know, the construction of Babylon to you know the Second World War, right? When have we ever been at peace, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much every artist is working in times of war or stress. So the thing that I actually want you guys to understand about romanticism is that romanticism is not so much about any one thing or idea, right? It's not nature poetry, it's not necessarily idealist poetry, it's not necessarily political poetry, it's not necessarily supernatural poetry, right? Some poets wrote it right about ghosts and spirits and shit, and some don't. What it is primarily about is the poet's mental imaginative process. Romanticism tends to be a very reflexive kind of art. What most of these poets are really writing about on some level is their own thought process. Even a poet like Blake, who writes in this weird visionary language, right? How many of you feel like you understood a Song of Liberty? Like, at all? To an extent. Okay. I had to read it about five times. Okay, you had to read it several times, <laughs> but you feel like you got something. Okay, what do you feel like you got out of it, Alan? Like, the, this idea of the revolutionary in America and France uh -huh. is a good, uh, he, I guess he was trying to think it's like a spark that he wants the rest of the world to catch. He's uh -huh. saying, wake up to the rest of the world, like, hey, this is a good thing. Right. We need to catch on to this. These old ideas we need to tear down, like the starry king falling or whatever. Yeah. So you, okay, so you did at least get that he's pro-revolution. Yes. <laughs> I got that after the second week. <laughs> that he is in faith. Yeah, he, he likes this kind of thing, right? Okay. And, um... The music that I was playing for you at the beginning of class, right, to, just to reference that quickly, um, is another Blake poem. It's called Jerusalem Put to Music. It's a popular English hymn, weirdly enough, given what it's actually about. Um, and the guy singing it uh, is a performer kind of associated with punk, new wave, and weirdly folk. Uh, his name is Billy Bragg. And the reason I chose the Bragg version of this rather than a more conventional choral version, is because Billy Bragg has a long connection to like left-wing British working class politics. So it seemed appropriate in discussing the French Revolution, and in particular, Blake's attitude towards it. So this is the original published page of A Song of Liberty. Blake's primary profession uh, was as an engraver. He didn't make money off of his poetry, he made money as an engraver. So he was a visual artist as well as a poet. And so most of his published poems are illuminated in, like this is actually fairly tame for a Blake page. But most of them are very fancifully illuminated, right? So he's communicating in terms of visual imagery in addition to verbal imagery. And would it be fair to say that this poem is visually very evocative? Even if you can't really understand what all of 
these different visions mean, right? Mm -hmm. Very simplistic. Yeah. So basically, in order to get Blake, you have to know a little bit about his personal system of symbolism and mythology, right? He has, Blake is not a conventionally religious person. He has his own kind of invented religion <coughs> that he expresses uh, through poems like this. So the villain in most of Blake's poetry is a figure that he often calls Urizen, which is meant to sound like Horizon, because Urizen is a figure of limitation. of rational order and of tyrannical rule. So the starry king in this poem, right, is never named as Urizen in the poem but it's the same figure, right? Blake uses the same figure in most of his kind of revolutionary poetry. Now, Urizen's enemy is a figure that he calls Orc. Now, do not associate this with um, like sort of more popular fantasy fiction versions of Orcs, right? You know, we're not talking about you know uh, sort of you know grunting. Uh, pig-like, you know, half-human, half-animal creature that runs around killing things. No World of Warcraft? No World of Warcraft, no. I was thinking World of Rings. Yeah, that was what I was thinking along those lines, too, yeah. I didn't like World of Warcraft. People are always trying to bother me, asking me to go on quests with them and things like that. No. No. <laughs> I just want to finish the adventure. I just want to, you know, I just want to be a warlock and have a demonic pet and, you know, cast spells and things. So, Orc, in Blake's poetry is a figure for rebellion, change, and freedom. And a lot of what Blake is doing in A Song of Liberty and in other poems like it is rewriting the Judeo-Christian story of the fall from heaven, but reversing the protagonist and the antagonist, right? The rebel spirit in Blake's version of the story is the good guy who is fighting against unjust tyranny in the form of this figure of limitation, right? Orc is good. Bad yeah. Is bad. Orc is the good guy. Urizen is the bad guy. Can I ask why yeah. Urizen uh, represents rational order when, like, rationalists, and maybe this is just me thinking uh -huh. too far into it, when rationalists are, like, the leftists, very pro liberty, uh -huh. pro that? Well, I'm actually getting to that. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to show here by giving you this poem, in addition to Wollstonecraft, right, is that people supported. People in Britain supported the revolution for different reasons. Right? Wollstonecraft's philosophical justification was that we are trying to impose rational order on a society that lacks it. Right? Things in this particular society are grossly unfair. There is ridiculous inequality that the current social structure can do nothing to address. So the logical thing to do, the reasonable thing to do, seems to be to change that social structure to make everyone more equal. Uh, yeah, Jeremy. How about that thing, the definition of rational mm -hmm. is different for people, so it keeps coming up. Sure. Uh, I was going to say, I think mm -hmm. that if but one for, person says mm -hmm. rational order and then someone is against them, but someone else is for rational order, uh -huh. it didn't necessarily mean that uh, right. their, their idea of rational is different. Like well, that, you know, 
But I think actually Blake and Wollstonecraft would have more or less the same idea of what is rational. It's just that for Wollstonecraft, the rational is a good thing to be imposed and help fix society. And Blake is arguing that actually this kind of chaos is productive. He's, he's celebrating the revolution for a completely different reason, right? He is celebrating the overturning of the old order as a kind of liberty and chaos and anarchy from which something new can grow. So he's really kind of in dialogue with both Burke and with Wollstonecraft, right? In dialogue with Wollstonecraft in that he's pro-revolution, but in dialogue with Burke in that he also has a more sort of organicist view of society, right? That what the revolution is actually going to do is rip down this artificial imposition and let us start growing unimpeded again, right? I think if you look at this last uh, last bit on page 160, right? Let the priests of the raven of dawn, no longer in deadly black, with hoarse note curse the sons of joy, nor his accepted brethren, whom tyrant he calls free, lay the bound or build the roof, nor pale religious lechery call that virginity that wishes but act not, for everything that lives is holy. So he's not talking about a system that imposes equality through a rational through rational ordering of things. What he's saying is that like if, hey, look, if we just if we kick if we kick out all the priests and kings, everybody's equal now anyway, right? If we tear off the false distinctions that separate people from one another, that they justify in the name of religion, in the name of politics, in the name of all other forms of social order, that everybody's equal anyway. And everybody's free. So yeah, this is an example of, like, of how you can use a kind of obscure visionary rhetoric to, st to make a political argument. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to completely ignore the Wordsworth poem, because we see Wordsworth coming at this from a rather different perspective, right? What Wordsworth is doing in the prelude, now, Blake is writing at the time of the revolution, right? <clears throat> Much as Burke and Wollstonecraft were, uh, were before things have started to go pear shaped Wordsworth is writing sometime after when his own original youthful enthusiasm for the revolution has faded, right? So Wordsworth's prelude is the work of an old man, or middle-aged man, looking back on a past self, right? A past version of himself. And all of Wordsworth's poetry is about himself. Right? Everything, is, everything is about Wordsworth. I'm not a huge Wordsworth fan, but we'll be uh, we'll be looking at plenty of Wordsworth in the, the coming days. Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking when we just made this um, Blake's contrast of old versus horizon, uh -huh. and how the good one is the rebellion and yeah. the change, and how limitations or uh, the big one's the rational order. What I got from Wordsworth is that uh -huh. at the beginning he agreed with that, but oh, he sure. wanted the change to be founded in rational thought. He mm -hmm. didn't want to lose it because if he did, that's when he got worried that things were going to go horseshit. Yeah, that um, things were all, and that's why after trying to understand this long, wordy, uh, well, and it is wordy, right? I mean, the guy's name is Wordsworth. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's, it's constructed very differently from Blake, right? Blake is giving us these apocalyptic visions of, you know, essentially like sort of angelic beings of various kinds fighting in the sky. Whereas Wordsworth is describing his own thoughts, feelings, and experiences in... I mean, yeah, it's verse, so the sentences can be a little convoluted. But in relatively plain and simple language, right? This is what I was doing then. This is what I was feeling then. 
Now, like Burke, Wordsworth also does a little bit of selective revision and leaves some things out of the prelude. For example, um, he leaves out the French mistress on whom he fathered a daughter. Um, she doesn't show up in the poem at all. Um, he leaves out or revises some of the political opinions of his friends. Um, and he largely leaves out um, any mention of any direct role he might have played in events, right? So he's just, you know, he's, you know, a young Englishman, right, fresh out of Cambridge, right, just finished college. He's in France. And there's all this heady, wacky shit going on, right? So if you wanted to sort of come up with maybe like a less violent analogy, right, uh, think about like the late 1960s. And like, you know, you're just, you know, this kid from somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest, graduates from college, goes out to San Francisco, and starts hanging out with the hippies and practicing free love and dropping acid, right? Going to Grateful Dead concerts. That's kind of what's going on with Wordsworth in his youth here, the youth he's describing in the prelude. And he's writing about that period in his life from a position of disillusion, right? Things did not work out the way I thought they were going to. Things did not ultimately go well. And I think what is probably most useful for us to focus on in terms of thinking about Wordsworth and his relationship to Romanticism more broadly is what he does to get himself back into sympathy with his own country, right? So if we look at the bottom of 393, can I get somebody to read from in the main outline? Yeah, uh, is that a hand up or are you just stretching? Well, it's a hand up now. <laughs> in the main outline, such it might be said, was my conditions Till with open war, bred opposed to liberties of France. This threw me first out of the pale of love, soared and corrupted upwards to the source. My sentiments was not, as hitherto, a swallowing up of lesser things and great, but change of them into their opposites, and thus the way was open for mistakes and false conclusions of the intellect, as gross in their degree and in their kind, far, far from dangerous. What kind, what had been a pride, was now a shame, my likings and my loves. Ran in new channels, leaving old ones dry, and thus a blood which in mature age mm -hmm. would but have touched the judgment struck more deep into sensations near the heart. Thank you. So, what's happened here, right, is that as Wordsworth is in France, enjoying himself immensely, Britain declares war on France. And so, what this does is create a sense of sort of divided loyalty, right? On the one hand, you know, he's happy here, he's in love, though he doesn't mention the girl that he's in love with at any point in the freaking poem. Um, and he is supportive of the ideals of the revolution. But then his home country declares war on this country he's fallen in love with. And initially, right, because his loves are running in new channels, he sides against his own nation, right, the nation of his birth. He sides with the French against Britain. So he seems in old age to regard this as a kind of treason. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Dejan. Yeah, go ahead. I, mean, I think we're, we're almost done anyway. I was trying to wake you. <laughs> I know that horrible feeling. Um, okay, so if we go then to page 394, what we see here is the process of Wordsworth's repatriation, right? He goes through all of this in France and comes back in order to become ultimately a better patriotic Englishman, right? Ah, then it was that thou, most precious friend, he's talking about his friend Samuel Taylor Coleridge here, who this is addressed. 
about this time first known to me, did lend a living help to regulate my soul. And then it was that the beloved woman in whose sight those days were past, this is his sister Dorothy, uh, Wordsworth and his sister have kind of a, they, the relationship is a little bit weird and charged. Like, they didn't grow up together. And biologically, the thing that prevents you from being sexually attracted to your relatives is smell. Wordsworth had no sense of smell. So, the picture you're think, painting is think terrifying. Of the, think of this what you will, yes. What line are you uh, Bottom of the page. That, that the beloved woman whose sight those days were past, now speaking in a voice of sudden admonition like a brook that does but cross a lonely road, and now seen, heard, and felt, and caught at every turn, companion never lost through many a league, maintained for me a saving intercourse with my true self, for though impaired and changed much, as it seemed, I was no further changed than as a clouded, not a waning moon. She, in the midst of all, preserved me still a poet, made me seek beneath that name my office upon earth and nowhere else. And lastly, nature's self by human love assisted, through the weary labyrinth conducted me again to open day, revived the feelings of my earlier life, gave me that strength and knowledge full of peace, enlarged and never more to be disturbed, which through the steps of our degeneracy, all de degradation of this age, hath still upheld me, and upholds me at this day in the catastrophe, for so they dream and nothing less, when finally to close and rivet up the gains of France, a pope is summoned in to crown an emperor. This last opprobrium, when we see the dog returning to his vomit, when the sun that rose in splendor was alive and moved in exaltation among living clouds, hath put his function and his glory off and turned into a gewgaw, a machine, set like an opera phantom. So the first thing he describes in this long verse paragraph is how coming back to England and spending time in the company of his sister and his friend Coleridge brought him back to a sense of his Englishness, right? And put him back in touch with his own national tradition and national roots, right? Put him back in touch with the concrete nature of Englishness rather than abstract notions he picked up in France. The other thing that he's describing here is the completion of his disillusionment with the revolution, right? All the things they said they stood for, then suddenly here's Napoleon rising as a dictator, and the Pope, the head of the church, they also thought they kicked out, coming in to crown him the emperor of France, right? So everything de uh, sort of degenerates into hypocrisy, right? He talks about sets like an opera phantom, right? Everything. All his memories of the, of the revolution looked to him like a theatrical stage, right? Where there were props and sets being moved about, but none of it was real. And none of it lasted, right? It's there as long as you're sitting in the theater, and then it's gone. The other thing that's interesting here, we're going to finish here again, uh, because it's about where we finished last time. I want you to think about the fact that he describes as his sort of vessel of repatriation, right, a woman, right? It's a woman who brings him back to a sense of national identity, right? So try to compare that to Burke. And also think about how that might relate to those birth pangs in the Blake column, right? When the eternal female groans and gives birth to Orc, the spirit of liberty. Okay. What's that? Well, it is a certainly a female personification of nature, yeah. All right, you are free to go. We'll see you on Monday. Don't forget to do that annotation exercise on the Equiano piece, right?